Today we're going to New Jersey where we'll meet Heaton Doshi of Doshi Capital Management. Heaton and his team run a market timing strategy which with a live track record of now almost nine years defies conventional wisdom that you cannot actually time the market. Heaton actually agrees with that when you're trying to time the market on a daily basis but with the right data and algorithms, you might as well succeed in identifying risk on and risk off periods of the market on a weekly or monthly basis. And so Doshi's algorithmic model brings together several investing disciplines into a multi-factor composite that forecasts short to intermediate term risk on and risk off periods of the market with the aim to grow and preserve capital in any market environment based on seven and a half years of fine-tuning and trading prop capital the strategy opened up to outside investors in 2020 ending up 147.5 percent net that year and continues its positive run in 2021. Heaton, just tell us a bit about yourself, your company and your strategy please. My name is Heaton Doshi and I'm the founder of Doshi Capital Management. Uh, I founded the firm in 2011 with the goal that investors should be able to generate returns in any market environment. Um, you know, living through uh, two recessions at, at that time, the tech crisis and the housing bubble, um, the goal of the firm was to be able to generate positive returns, absolute positive returns, regardless of the market environment or the economic environment. Um, you know, our view and our belief was that investors shouldn't have to suffer these, you know, corrections. We had, you know, two 50% corrections during the housing and the tech bubble. And then even more recently, we had a, you know, 35% correction during the pandemic. Uh, and so for a buy and hold investor, you know, they have to suffer, they have to hold through that volatility. And our goal was to be able to create a strategy where it's more dynamic and provides more diversification while generating absolute positive returns year in and year out. Um, you know, in our view, a strategy should really diversify the entire portfolio, right? It should be a component of a portfolio. It should lower overall portfolio risk, um, but it should also generate, you know, positive returns uh, for the portfolio. Believe it or not, over the past two decades, the S&P 500 has had negative weeks 45% of the time, right? So that's pretty amazing if you think about it, that almost half the time the S&P is negative on a weekly basis. Um, and what, what's special about our strategy is that we not only avoid many of those weeks, but we generate alpha during those weeks. Right? And that's, that's, that's how the strategy is able to have such a high risk reward ratio, right? A, a high sharp ratio um, is because we generate alpha when the market is actually down. So our strategy, it's a, it's a market timing uh, strategy. It, it's systematic, uh, it's algo driven. It, we built a model that determines risk on and risk off periods for the overall US equity market. Uh, the way the model works is it takes into account a multitude of investing disciplines. You know, our view in, in market timing, and we get, this, we get this question a lot because the conventional wisdom is you cannot time the markets, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to. And while on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, I would, I would tend to agree with that, um, over a short to intermediate term, over, over weeks and possibly months, you know, in our, our view is that you absolutely can time the markets. The way we look at timing the markets is we break it into three different components, right? We break it into data. We look at uh, contrarian and momentum data. We break it into market data and behavioral data. And then we break it down into speed of algorithm. We look at different frequencies of data and we use different speeds of algorithms to gauge that short to intermediate term um, you know, forecast of the, of the market. In terms of the, da the data that we use, we have a proprietary earnings revisions indicator that we, that we look at. Um, and this is a very powerful tool. There's been a lot of academic research behind earnings revisions and the impact that it has and the behavioral impact that it has uh, on investors. 
We also looked at data from fixed income to commodity prices, to interest rates, uh, to volatility, to economic data, sentiment data, trader positioning. So we look at a wide array of data uh, that goes into the model to, to forecast you know, the, the risk on and risk off periods. To execute the, the, the strategy, we use uh, E-mini futures. Um, we use uh, the S&P E-minis and we use long-term treasury bond futures. Um, you know, we do this one for liquidity reasons and, and two for the tax efficiency that it gives. Uh, you know, futures are a 1256 um, uh, contract by the IRS and they're automatically given a 60% long-term and 40% short-term capital gains tax rate. Uh, this is very beneficial. Uh, especially for a strategy that is short-term in nature. The goal of the strategy uh, is to be able to maneuver around the market to forecast short to, short to intermediate term periods and to generate absolute positive returns regardless of the environment. And you know, one of the biggest benefits of this strategy is that, is that it provides a lot of diversification. Right? In our view, there are two types of risks. There's unsystematic risk, which is single stock risk, and then there's also systematic risk, which are the, the bigger, the macro risks. Uh, and our strategy diversifies away both of those because we invest in the overall index. So we're not taking single stock risk. We're not investing in single stock names. And then we also diversify systematic risk just by the nature of the market timing, right, of the strategy. So it's a, it's a macro model and it, it looks to avoid those, those larger events. Our focus has been on cycles, you know, in, in my past history and career, you know, we've done, we've done a lot of work on macro cycles. And so embedding that cyclical work into this model allows us to forecast these sort of mini cycles in the, in the market. And so the benefit of the strategy is that it provides a lot of diversification. Uh, it's uncorrelated to almost any other asset class, whether it's equities or fixed income or REITs or um, bonds or gold or even other alternative assets. So, you know, the strategy has a low correlation to almost anything else um, it provides a lot of diversification, but it also generates a lot of alpha, right? And, and that's the goal is to provide lower risk and higher returns. And so that's what that's the sort of the theme we built the strategy around uh, and the focus when we were developing the strategy. During the pandemic, our strategy was was actually risk off going into the, into the pandemic. Uh, you know, obviously the model does not did not predict the pandemic, but uh, looking at the ind indicators that that model takes in, uh, it was on a, it was in a risk off mode, and so we were actually in you know long term treasuries entering the pandemic. So we benefited um, on the way down, and then also towards the the the, the correction, the model then went then went risk on. Uh, and it actually stayed risk on for almost the remainder of the year. So we benefited on the way down and on the way up. Uh, and we, and the, what really contributes to that is that the model is contrarian and it's momentum. So, you know, going into the pandemic, it was, it was contrarian. It was saying the market was overbought. It was saying indicators were elevated. Um, so it had a risk off view. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, the, the, the model was actually changing on a week to week basis, right? I, I don't know if you remember, but at that, at that moment, the S&P was moving quite a bit. We had a 16% down week and then a big rebound and then another you know, correction after that. So the model was actually timing week to week the, the market moves on the way down. But then um, I think towards the, uh, the end of May, when, when the rebound really started to happen in, in, in the overall market, the model went risk on. And it stayed risk on for, for you know, weeks to months, right? So that's the momentum effect uh, of the model. Um, and, and really that's, that's the beauty of it is that it, it takes into account contrarian data, it takes into account uh, momentum data, and then it also takes into account behavioral data. Because if you look at just the, the absolute data at that time, right, job, jobs numbers were still you know, pretty bad, right? Uh, claims were, were very high, unemployment was very high, the economy was still shutting down. No one knew anything about COVID. You know, we we're still learning the effects and the impact of COVID at that time, but sentiment was changing, right? Um, that 35% correction, um, you know, led investors to believe that that the worst was behind in terms of the the, the market correction. Um, and that's what that's what the model does. The market the model doesn't just look at the absolute data; it looks at behavioral data, right? Uh, and we've had a lot of people that you know, that we've spoken to, and they didn't understand really. They were like. 
why is the market rallying, right? Why is the market rallying in a V-shape when the economy is cratering still? And it's really about forward expectations, right? It's about behavioral expectations. Uh, and a lot of investors don't understand that. They look at the absolute data and they say, wow, this is horrible. I don't understand it. So, you know, the, the, the way we built the strategy is to not just look at economic data, but to look at sentiment, positioning. You know, what are other investors doing? How are other investors positioning? Because at the end of the day, the, the market has, it has a mind of its own, right? The market is behavioral. You could have one position, but if the market's going against you, it's going to go against you, right? And so um, the way we look at the data is behavioral and it's also speed and frequency, right? So by, by, being, by having shorter term frequency data and shorter term you know, calculations, we're able to have that week to week move that we saw in, in, in March when the market was correcting, but then also having those longer term data, that, that longer term algorithms and the, and the momentum data that comes into, into the model, we're able to you know, ride the wave up. And so you know, when the market was rallying, we had a lot of investors calls and say they got out, right? The market corrected 35%. And then when it started to bounce, they start to trim their positions as the market was moving up, thinking that it was going to correct again. And it never did. The market never came back. The market just continued to rally relentlessly. Um, and that's the advantage of having a systematic model, right? We, we follow the model, we follow the data, and the model is said to stay risk on throughout. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we had an amazing year. Uh, and to be honest, you know, if, if we didn't have that model to follow behaviorally, we probably would have also said, hey, we should trim our position on the way up because, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there um, regarding the pandemic and COVID. But, you know, the model had it right. The model stayed invested, you know, on the, on the way up and the market just continued to rally. So, you know, last year um, was, was a great example of, of market timing and the systematic approach that takes away the behavioral, the discretionary, the emotional biases that a lot of investors face. Um, and, and that's why we built this model, right? It's, it's to, in, in order to be able to produce returns year in and year out, it has to be systematic. It has to be without emotional bias. It has to be without interference. Uh, and and that, that was the goal of, uh, of our strategy. What underlies this entire strategy is our risk management approach, right? Uh, and so um, the way we look at risk management is it's all, we run a adaptive algorithmic stop loss strategy. Um, and that, that, that was actually done in 2019, um, you know, several years after we implemented this strategy. And it was done because we felt the market was changing, right? Um, I don't know if you remember December of 2018, um, the market was moving down two to three percent a day. It, it was just relentless and it was unbelievable. Um, and in our mind, it was all algo driven, right? Um, you know, the algorithms, computers wanted to hit a certain level um, in the markets and then it started to rebound. So in our view, if, if the way investing is changing is going to become more computer driven, more algo driven, then the risk management has to adapt to that, right? So we actually switched from a discretionary approach to an algo-driven stop loss strategy. And that's what underlies um, you know, the entire approach. And the way we do it is we have an adaptive uh, strategy that moves with the market. Um, it allows for the normal fluctuations uh, in the market. And believe it or not, on a daily basis from high to low, the S&P moves one and a half percent on average, right? Over, over years. Um, and in a bull market, you have these three to 5% corrections, which are by the dip moment. So you don't want to get stopped out in, in, in those scenarios, but you do want to be prepared for, you know, a larger correction. Um, and also the way our, our strategy, our risk management works is that as the market continues to move higher, the stop loss tightens because the higher you, the higher the market moves without a correction, the more likely it's going to correct, right? So, so we've built this risk management strategy. Um, to, to, to be adaptive, to move with the market, to protect investors, you know, capital, um, and, to, and to, to protect from, from large downside risk. We launched a strategy in, in 2012, but we actually just recently opened up to outside investors uh, in the beginning of 2020. And the reason for that was, you know, we actually had a, quite a long incubation period. I mean, we've been um, we've been developing this strategy for the past eight years, believe it or not, uh, and that may seem like a long time, but in, in our mind, we wanted to provide investors with a strategy that we were 100% confident in. Uh, and so, you know, over those eight years, we, we tweaked the strategy, we uh, tweaked the risk management, 
Um, you know, we initially had taken a discretionary and systematic approach to, to investing, even though we had this model. Um, but then in the end, we realized that, you know, the purely systematic approach was, was the way to go. Uh, and that the discretionary sort of overriding and interventions, um, you know, were, were hurting the, the strategy. So, you know, it, it took time, but we worked out, you know, the process, the approach. Uh, and then, you know, when we decided to go purely systematic, when we um, developed the uh, systematic risk management approach, um, you know, we then felt comfortable that this is something that could achieve the goals that we set forth. You know, our, our goal is not to make money off of fees. Um, you know, if that was the, the goal, we would have tried to raise money since day one. Uh, but but the, our goal is to generate returns for investors, right? Um, it's not just to sit there and charge fees off mediocre returns. So at the end of 2019, we came to the conclusion um, that we had finalized the approach, the process, the model, the risk management of the entire strategy. And so in the beginning of 2020 is when we opened it up to outside investors. So our team consists of uh, myself, you know, I founded the firm uh, and, and developed the, the strategy. Uh, we also have a chief operating officer, uh, Haim Miller, uh, and we have a director of uh, new business development, uh, Wilson Leong, and then we have a software developer, uh, Mike Lamont. Um, and so actually one of the things that I, I probably should have mentioned is we've, we've been developing software to run this strategy, right? Um, because we've decided to go purely systematic, it doesn't require any human intervention. So for the past year, we've been developing our own software to run the entire strategy autonomously, 100% um, hands off. Uh, and, and to, to remove any of that emotional or discretionary bias, right? Um, and to let the model decide what to do uh, in terms of trading the strategy. Currently, our investor base is, is all high net worth investors. Um, you know, last year uh, we had a we had a, a quite a bit of influx from high net worth investors. Um, you know, for, for two reasons. One, uh, most high net worth investors have that 60-40 traditional component, um, you know, of equities and bonds in their portfolio, and they wanted to diversify. They want they're looking for something that generated better returns with that diversification. Um, the other component was we we we, we had people come over from financial advisors. Um, you know, financial advisors did not do that well during the pandemic, right? They did not protect their investors from the volatility um, and didn't generate, you know, um, returns for them. So uh, we had people that took money away from financial advisors and wanted to put it in a strategy that provided better diversification that was a high alpha strategy. You know, um, the way we look at it is our, our, you know, potential investor base is really high net worth and family offices. Um, and we've been getting great reception from family offices. Uh, you know, we have a number of family offices that are tracking our performance um, and, and, are, and are looking forward to the second half of, of 2021. Um, we're also getting on the radar of institutions and RIAs. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to get onboarded onto several platforms for RIAs so that they can also uh, offer our strategies to, the, to their clients. Um, and the feedback that we get from pretty much, uh, pretty much anyone we talk to is that this is such a unique strategy, right? It's such a different approach to investing. Um, and it's something that really piques their interest. Uh, but, you know, of course, like everyone, you know, they, they want to see the returns, they want to see the, the track record, um, and they want to follow it for a while, which is, which is you know, absolutely okay with us, because uh, we're confident that, you know, our returns will, will meet its goals, and then um, these investors will, will come on board. But um, since we launched, we've been raising money almost every month, honestly. Um, and so we've had a great reception and, you know, we look forward to continue to grow the fund. So that's a question that we get a lot. Uh, you know, the strategy, uh, it's primarily um, uh, an S&P index strategy, right? So it's market timing. Um, but, the, you know, the question that we, that we get a lot is, you know, how does the strategy perform in a rising rate environment if you're using a dual asset class uh, strategy? And, you know, really the way we look at it is that investing in treasuries uh, is a hedge against equities, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's a hedge on being risk off. So we're not taking a view on, on treasuries. We're not taking a view on where interest rates are going, but we're using it as a hedge. And then we have a stop loss that underlies that as well. Uh, and we even saw, you know, back in, in the beginning of 2020, where interest rates were already very low, you know, the 10 year was 60, 70 basis points it went down to 30 basis points, right? I mean, if there's a reason for the market to be risk off, 
uh, interest rates will continue to go down, right? No matter how low they already are. So uh, in, in our view, you know, we're not taking a long-term view on, on treasuries. Treasuries are a hedge. Um, they're a week-to-week -week hedge and a, and a risk-off uh, model. Um, and so the, the way we look at uh, the strategy is, is that, you know, we're looking at where the S&P is going, not where, where treasury is going.